This morning's reading comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40, and then from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. From Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, good morning. How is everyone this morning? All right? Sorry? Top of the pops. <laughs> well, it's good to be with you. My name's Dave, and I'm part of the staff here. And uh, we're starting a new series um, this morning. The series has been titled, uh, Winter is Coming. Well, it's here. Uh, the series, at least. I'm not sure about the weather. So the weather in the series, well, they haven't quite fitted in, but we had no um, role in that. I, I, I cannot organize colder weather. And that's how it is. But in the series that we're doing, uh, it's a series of six, if you remember correctly, uh, morning and evening for three weeks. So if you want to get the whole series, you come to the morning and evening, and the Thursday service does the evening ones as well. So the people who are part of Thursday, if you come to Thursday and Sunday morning, you get the full series. So that's kind of how it works. Are you with me? Um, what are we trying to achieve in this series? Notice we've taken phrases that people are using in conversations today. So what are we trying to achieve? Well, I think we're trying to achieve this. We're trying to understand in the context of some of the real issues that face our world today how we, and Christ, we as Christians and as a church should respond and act. The one thing we don't want Christians or the church to be is like a bunch of ostriches. Uh, I don't know if you've seen ostriches, you know, with their, their heads in the ground. That's what we don't want. Because when we're like that, we are saying to the world, well, God is not interested in what's happening when we are quiet, when we do nothing about the issues around us. Christianity, we say, has got nothing to say. And we don't want to give that message. God is the God, not just of the church. God is the God of all nations. God is the God who created everything. And he's concerned for his world. And so we must and should be very concerned for our world. So I hope in this series we just learn 
together how to respond Christianly with a Christian worldview, if you like, in our thinking, in our hearts. So many of these subjects are emotional. What are the emotions we should have? And then thirdly, in our bodies, as in how we act or behave. Mind, heart, body. What is the Christian response? How do Christians deal with that? Does that make sense to you? I hope some of that um, happens um, in our time together. Gracious Father, help us in this series. Help us to learn to respond to our world with the heart of Christ and the mind of Christ. That our actions would be uh, based on your calling to us as Christians. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Today the subject um, is, uh, what was the phrase? Uh, What's with all this war? Uh, What do we do with these wars? Right now, as we sit here, there are two major battles happening in our world. There's a battle that's been going on since 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine. What do you make of that? Then there's another battle, slightly different, very different. Russia uh, invading Ukraine is kind of makes, it doesn't make sense, but you kind of see a nation against a nation and one nation defending itself. And that's divided the world, as war does. There's nothing pleasant about war. It's divisive. But the other battle is a bit more complex. Because the other battle in the Middle East is a response from Israel after an attack, a terrorist attack from Hamas in October last year. Yet Israel has responded with mighty force. And we see what's happening in Gaza. Yet that's created all sorts of emotions. Is that the right response? To go after a whole bunch of people like that? That created debate and ugliness. You've heard the emotions. What do we do? Let me say firstly, but by just way of introduction, that God has made us rational, emotional, and of course, with a body. And so yes, we, we react, and we should rationally look at what's going on. See what's going on. Don't turn our backs on it. Work to make sense of it where we can make sense. But ask ourselves this question. If God is the God of all nations, if God is alive and ruling from above, our Lord is on the throne, what does God think about what's going on? Let let that Help us in our thoughts and our responses as well. What do our doctrines say? How do that help us, our beliefs, to react? That doesn't mean we have all the clear answers. But we can't just listen to every voice and react to all the voices. We, as Christians, have to begin to think properly. And respond, and I hope as I go through some of the things, some principles today, that that would help. When we look at our world, we can ask, what is the cause? Now, war war is complex. War is very complex. There isn't one cause, is there? But there are things happening in our world 
which are sad. We see a rise, if you like, of nationalism, tribalism. One culture, one group, saying we are better than another, another group, and therefore we can treat them badly, if you want to simplify it. They're not as good as us, almost. I mean, there's pride in one's own nation to an extent that there is a dislike sometimes for other nations. So we see this nationalism, this tribalism, we see hatred. Prejudice, violence, not only in those two battles, but everywhere. So if I may be bold enough to suggest that the world is at war. Because all those things are going on. And what is the Christian response? How should we be thinking about nationalism and tribalism and the hatred and the violence that's going on there? And what should our emotions be? When our Lord Jesus Christ was on this world, he reacted sometimes to things with anger. There is a righteous anger. He reacted sometimes with real pain. When he entered Jerusalem, he wept. And can I suggest that that is one of the great or most significant emotions for Christians to have, lament. When you look at those pictures, another child wrapped in a cloth in Gaza ready to be buried, another mother, another father, we should be weeping. Lament. When you look at a picture of a battlefield and you see just the boots of a soldier, the rest of him has been blown up. It should break us. Because it breaks God. Christians are a lamenting people. We know the reality of sin in our world. We know that the sin and the rebellion of the world, we are, in a broader sense, under the judgment of God. We're not in heaven. And there is real ugliness and hatred. We lament. You know, it's um, 1917. Some of you remember that do you remember 1917? Were you there? I think it was April. Woodrow Wilson, speaking to Congress, those famous words, First World War, declares war on Germany, responds from America. This will be the war that will end all wars. And I don't know if you know the rest of what happened after that. There was a great cheer as he got support from Congress. And as he walked out of Congress, there was a great cheer. And Woodrow Wilson broke down in tears. He said, they are cheering and I am sending men to die. Of course, it wasn't the war to end all wars. Because that's the world we live in. The side of heaven. So let me look at three things quickly. That I hope will help us in our thinking, in our emotions, and in our behavior. Three things. The first thing I want to look at, they're three Ps. As Christians, we are to proclaim the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. There isn't a time when it's not a season 
to proclaim the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel. But just think about this. This gospel we proclaim is not just God's on the throne, everything's okay. I'm not sure that's going to be a helpful conversation, as much as we may believe that. This gospel we proclaim isn't just uh, the Lord Jesus Christ saves. As much as that's true. Have you thought about the gospel we believe in? Have you thought about what what are the things that happen when our Lord Jesus Christ will go to the cross? There's so much more depth to the gospel than we realize that is so relevant and so helpful to our world. The gospel we called to proclaim to a messy, sinful, rebellious world. It was C.S. Lewis who said, In prosperity, God whispers to us. But in adversity, he shouts at us. And I think it's in times of adversity that we really come into touch with the reality of the gospel. Do you believe that the proclamation of the gospel is helpful to a world in distress? Because this gospel that we believe in is a gospel about a Savior who suffered and died. Only only Christianity has a God who suffered, proving, in one sense, his commitment to us in our brokenness, our pain, and our sinfulness. Christianity has at its heart an act of tragic and unjust suffering and death. At its heart. Can you see the relevance of that gospel to today? He is so committed to ending suffering and death that he will go to the cross dealing with judgment and sin, that he will go to the cross. He will go through injustice. He will go through suffering. Isn't that a message that's helpful to today's world? And he will rise from the dead so that there is such a thing as a new heaven and a new earth. There is hope. And as Christians, when we speak, when we act, when we share our emotions, do they reflect hope? Do they reflect a suffering Christ who went through injustice, an unjust trial, and experienced injustice? A Christ who's real in the context of our world. Not just Heaven, it will all be fine. It's okay. God is in control. Do you see what a wonderful gospel we have? No other religion can speak to that. Proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when Christ Jesus died on that cross, he did not die as a nationalist. He did not die as a tribalist. He did not die with hatred in his heart for enemies or a particular race, person, culture, nation. For God so loved the world that as he died, he reached out from every tribe. Every nation breaking down any sense of nationalism, tribalism. Is that the gospel we believe in?
that gospel that brings salvation where Christ dies in our place and takes the judgment we deserve is much bigger than you think. Does it impact us? Mind, heart, body, action. Secondly, we proclaim. Secondly, we play. We play on the field. We engage with the world. As I said, we don't be like ostriches with our heads in the hole. And can I say, we play the ball, not the man, the person, in a sense. We play the righteous gospel ball. We don't play the person. Ah, it's all, it's all the fault of the Muslims. That is not helpful. Or it's all the fault of the Jews. Or it's all thems. We divide theys and thems. Which reveals in our hearts some ugly prejudices when we do that. We're not playing the people. We get out there. We prepare to get our hands dirty. We engage the world. We're on the playing field. There was a rugby match yesterday. Rory's still suffering. Uh, the Lions and the Glasgow Warriors. The captain of the Glasgow Warriors, if I may mention him. Sorry to talk about your son here, uh, Rory. But <laughs> the captain stood up afterwards. He was devastated at the loss. It was a big loss. He did the graceful thing and thanked the Lions. But he did say something like this. We didn't really pitch. We didn't really pitch as a team. That happens in sport. We as Christians and the churches, let it not be seen of us that we did not arrive, that we were not there, that we did not pitch. And let me give you three motivations to play. You know how a coach has to motivate the side? Well, let me give you three motivations. When we play in the real world with real problems in a, a world, it as I said, it is at war in many ways. Firstly, we are motivated by love. Did you listen to that reading? The great commandment that Anthea read to us. The law of love. The law is love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on to these two commandments. How does that affect us in our world where we see so much of this going on? Notice we love God. So in our conversations which we must not ignore, we must not walk away from. People have got real conversations that they want to have. People have got real fears. People have got real concerns. I was on a call this week, uh, a Zoom call, and speaking to a young person in Vienna. They are worried. Europe is worried. What's going to happen? There was real fear, and there is here. Tonight, come tonight, and we'll look at our South African winter. Love God. Our conversation, they reflect that we love God. Our actions, do they reflect that we love God? Or are we speaking with the same bitter tongues that others are speaking of? The same hatred tongues? The same divisive tongues? We love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And if we love God, then what will we do? We will love our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? 
as, we, as you go through the Old Testament, look at neighbor, it's the one in trouble, the vulnerable. All people are neighbors, but especially the vulnerable, the hurting, the pain. The immigrant, the person who's been attacked, beaten, and has had family members shot and killed. Doesn't matter who they are, it's your neighbor. See, on the playing field, if we're going to play, we're going to love God and love neighbor, and that's going to reflect in us, in our language, our conversations, in our life. There's a, there, there's a motivation. The second motivation I want you to think about is the cross. The cross is a great motivation. At the cross, our salvation is one. We have uh, the sacrifice of atonement, if you like. But it's not only there... The cross is not only just a place where salvation is won. Peter says it is an example to follow in our world. Luke would say, I think it's in Luke chapter 9, we are to deny ourselves, take up our crosses and follow Jesus daily. That's part of the great commandment, isn't it? To love your neighbor is doing just that as well. It is to live at the cross. Jesus, on the cross, after being treated unjustly, did not see revenge as something great and wonderful. Revenge was off the cards. The cross tells us revenge is off the cards. Hatred is off the cards. Prejudices, tribalism, anti-immigrant, whatever it is, off the cards. The cross tells us. That's off the cards. The cross is so powerful, so, so, so powerfully impacts us when people see us and hear our conversations. Is it cross centered? Being prepared to make sacrifices. Put selfishness and our own views aside, as Christ did on the cross. Listen to others and their pain. Thirdly, we are motivated to be motivated by the kingdom, the kingdom of righteousness. Matthew's gospel, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. And as you look again at the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, if you like, isn't that there? God's kingdom controls us. Sure, we are not here as Christians to bring in a utopia. We're not here to... Um, Bring in God's kingdom in its fullness. That is going to happen. Uh, it was C.S. Lewis, uh, if I can find the quote, who again uh, said something interesting, as he often does. It would have really helped if I had brought a pair of glasses with me today. Are those reading glasses? At the bottom. All right, thank you. So, don't I look good? Um, C.S. Lewis, Lewis pointed out that times of war or disaster uh, make us understand, he says, misery and death, which is regular. It wakes us up from our illusion that life is manageable. If we had foolish hopes about human culture, they are now shattered if we thought we were building up a heaven on earth, if we looked for something that would turn the present world from a place of pilgrimage into a permanent city, satisfying the soul of men, we are disillusioned. And not a moment too soon. In ordinary times, only the wise realize it. Now, in wartime, the stupidest of us know it. 
No, we're not trying to create a heaven on earth. But God's kingdom of righteousness, God's values that belong to that kingdom are the values we must live by, we must call for, we must believe in, and we must stand for. God's concerns for justice. We cannot ignore just the need for justice. That is a value of God's kingdom, the kingdom of righteousness. God's concern for the value of human life, the sanctity of human life. We cannot turn our backs on that. It's a kingdom value. And we can go on. You can take much more. What are the values of the kingdom? Harmony amongst people which you'd see in the cross, which you'd see in love your neighbor and in the kingdom. They're all similar. We are to be motivated as we live, as we speak, in our conversations, in our language, and as we uh, display our emotions. We are to be motivated by the command to love God and to love neighbor. We are to be motivated by the cross in our broken world. We are to be motivated by... The kingdom. Because here's the issue. Well, one of the issues. Folks, if those things don't motivate us, we will hear the voices of the world. They will influence us. Our own prejudices won't be dealt with. Our ugliness, the ugliness of nationalism will not be challenged. And tribalism. And folks, when you look to Christ on the cross, when you look to the gospel... Those things are off the cards. And when we are not living under the kingdom, with the kingdom values, loving our neighbor and God, living under the cross, we are an obstacle to the truth of the gospel. We are an obstacle. And in these times, Christians are not to be obstacles. We are to be the voice of the gospel of righteousness. We are to be the compassionate people of God, displaying love. We are to be the people who speak truth. And sometimes that's a hard truth. Truth to power, gospel truth to power. We are to speak, live, and have emotions that are impacted by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we can be helpful and relevant. And so as we go out here, may God change our conversations, our language. May God change our emotions. We're not an unemotional people. May God change our behavior. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, what a gospel. Remind us that you are on the throne, you rule and you are caring, you are sustaining, you are involved in this world, you are the God of all nations, the creator God. The God is concerned for what is right and just. But help us, Lord, in these times of ugliness and hatred and violence and genocide and just so much that's going on. To think what it means to be Christian in thought, heart, and action. May your voice be our our influence so that we may be of help, that we may be relevant and rid us of the obstacles so we can speak with truth and love the way Christ loved and behave righteously. We ask in your precious and glorious name. Amen.